The alarm was raised just after 7 o'clock when neighbours noticed smoke billowing from the Krebert Street home. The first units on scene found the back of the house in flame. It's thought the fire started in a rear bedroom. Concerns were held for the home's occupants who hadn't been seen fleeing the fire. A search of the badly damaged cottage confirmed no one had been home, although the body of a pet cat was found inside. Pet birds and a dog were released from other parts of the house. Firefighters stopped the blaze from spreading to a neighbouring house, although it did suffer heat and smoke damage. Until today, Erilyn Lodge at Araring was home to 25 elderly residents. Its closure has left 17 of them facing an uncertain future. Many have mental and physical disabilities. With no nursing home beds available, Hunter Health has been forced to reopen a building at the Allendale Nursing Home as temporary accommodation. Finding them permanent homes will depend on government. Until funds are identified um, from either state or federal level to relocate these people to permanent accommodation. So, so they could be there for... 12 months or more, yes. Erilyn Lodge is just the latest boarding house forced to close. There are 20 or so others in the Newcastle region. All are faced with the same problem, meeting the costs of complying with strict new government guidelines on aged care. In their attempts to try and meet the requirements of ageing and disabilities legislation, will have difficulty meeting it and consequently may close beds. Any further closures would push the waiting list for aged care beds in the region towards the 600 mark. Support groups blame the federal government funding formula, which pays for 90 beds per 1,000 people over the age of 70. That formula doesn't account for the level of need. We've got 550 plus people waiting for aged care beds and you can't just ignore them. Outgoing Commander Chief Superintendent Heinz Moller was given the red carpet treatment as he arrived for his last day at work. After 35 years in the force, Chief Superintendent Moller not only said goodbye to his old job, but also to an old mode of policing. I trust in you, law enforcement, for the Hunter District, and I wish you and all your staff all the best in the future. Handing over the reins to Chief Superintendent Terry Collins, 55-year-old Moller says his time at the helm was the highlight of his career. With a tinge of sadness, I'll miss the people I've worked with. Uh, you have a tremendous uh, police in the Hunter District. Responsible for restructuring the police force in the Hunter, Chief Superintendent Collins says while he's excited, there's still work to be done. I'm looking forward to the challenge that's uh, certainly looking at embarking upon a, a reform program that will run for the next five years uh, where there will be a lot of um, hard yards to be made. From today, the new Hunter region includes Tari and Foster and reduces the number of patrols from 164 to 80. Chief Superintendent Collins dismissed as nonsense the belief that the new structure will reduce police numbers in some areas. It isn't about closing down, it is in fact uh, Raymond Terrace will do very well under the process and in fact we'll have more police on the street than they've had before, not only in Raymond Terrace but Nelson Bay, Maitland and Cessnock. Simon Cobb, NBN News. Wayne Richards rejoined the Knights this year after a stint with Illawarra and while the powerful second rower has missed the last few weeks through injury, he commands the utmost respect from his peers. 
when he was in the back of the plane second round, we were all together. He made a, you know, he's a, he's a great worker, a good athlete, and um, and combine that with being in his best form he's been in for a long time, I think he was, he was sadly missed. So. Richards has signed a three-year deal with the club, while on the playing front he's expected to make a return to the paddock in three weeks. The team focus now is on Friday night's clash against Sydney City. The Knights have had the wood on the Roosters this year, a win in the Telethon charity match, followed up by a 28-16 victory in the Optus Cup. Eastern Suburbs always tends to bring out the best in us, and um, I think we had that game at the start of the year was our best ever game so far this year as far as things clicking and, and performing. So. With Jason Moody still recovering in hospital from that incident on Saturday, Malcolm really has promoted Mark Hughes to the wing. In the only other team change, Daniel Smales joins the bench for the suspended Andrew Johns. Jonathan Upton, NBN News. The home study course has been developed by Tokal Agricultural College in consultation with landholders. The two-year program hones in on property planning and sustainability issues. The course gives uh, landholders the skills and the knowledge to better plan their properties, design what they want from it according to the land's capabilities and also measure what is actually happening as they do the work. About 230 people have joined up so far. They receive regular learning packages from TOCAL but can complete the work at their own pace. We come together for two residentials. In the first year we teach them how to use aerial photographs uh, for property planning uh, at the college here in an exercise and then they can go back to their own properties and do uh, the same exercise on their own farms. And in the second year, we look at catchment issues in some part of New South Wales. Depending on the level of certificate required, landholders can choose from a number of electives, including managing waterways, farm chemical use and fencing. The information's come from people involved in the electric fencing industry, from professional fencers, from fencing contractors, from people who've built many fences, from people who've taught fencing, and even from people who've designed some of the knots. With 95 trucks on the road, Martin's stock haulage has become a prime mover in business growth. As its clientele spread further afield, the scone-based company says it made good economic sense to acquire Finnamore's livestock division in the south of the state. We found a situation where we were travelling south, they were travelling north, passing one another, empty trucks. And in any successful business today, you have to have full utilisation. As part of the multi-million dollar expansion, the company has bought 14 new semi-trailers and employed another 20 people in Wagga, taking total staff numbers to 150. Martin Stock Haulage, now the biggest livestock carrier in the state, is the one-man, one-truck success story started up by Gordon Martin 38 years ago. Yeah, 1960 started and uh, you know, we've been up to big truck numbers before. We've, we run a coal business which we were successful with. And uh, as I repeat, it's only because I've got younger people around us that we're sort of reju rejuvenating this. With a booming bulk haulage business and a hope beef prices can only improve, prospects for the company are looking bright. Livestock haulage is a very personal business. 
I wouldn't be doing the business at my age only for the simple reason I've got some wonderful young people around us and they'll take this business into the future. Simon Cobb, NBN News. In the highlands north of Singleton, where the blady grass grows in abundance, lives a small native animal unknown to most Australians. Normally hidden by dense undergrowth, the Hastings River mouse was recently discovered on a private property for the first time. We had a bit of a hunt really. There had been some bone fragments found here uh, about 10 years ago in the general area and it just happened that uh, my, father, my mother was walking around and found a corpse. Martin Folding sent the remains to the Australian Museum, where it was identified as the extremely rare mouse, only ever known to exist in protected areas. The National Parks and Wildlife Service then conducted a survey and found a thriving population. We captured uh, seven individuals, which, which shows that there's quite a few um, animals in this area. Um, it seems to be uh, quite specific in the areas that it's, it's using here. It appears the area is an oasis for the mouse with its cool moist forests, thick grasses for protection and an array of food sources. But what makes the colony so unusual is that its habitat is on private land. You can be in for quite a few surprises that things do inhabit areas that you wouldn't expect because this has been grazed and logged in the past and yet uh, they've still managed to hang on. Both men say if more landowners conserve their forest remnants and wetlands, then more endangered flora and fauna would be preserved for generations to come. Simon Cobb, NBN News. The mobile dental unit cost Hunter Health $105,000. Had it not set the money aside in its last budget, the service may not have been able to afford it. The decision by the federal government to axe its dental care program has cut Hunter Health's dental budget by $3 million or 50%. Launching the mobile unit, outgoing Hunter Health boss Dr Tim Smythe warned the cuts have bitten deep. We haven't been able to have the range of services that we had previously and secondly the waiting times for our public sector dental services have started to climb. The mobile unit is part of the effort to keep waiting lists under control. In the Hunter, some 10,000 adults and 4,500 school children are eligible for the service. The surgery on wheels is fitted out to provide the full range of regular procedures, everything from pulling teeth and fillings to denture work. The unit will concentrate its visits in small communities in the Upper Hunter, saving patients the long trip to Newcastle. Prior to this we were working with the child dental service and in a successful way with the school based program. This is our first opportunity that we've had to establish public dental services in the Upper Hunter. The unit will generally set up in school grounds and at nursing homes. Phil Hind, NBN News.
As they do most... A big issue, but the threat of losing seven jobs at Murrurundi's rail depot has the small town worried. Recently we've lost the bank, uh, two banks. Uh, North Power Depot closed, both the works depot and the sales section. Um, so, you know, we can ill afford to lose any more. The state opposition has accused the Carr government of planning to kill off the CountryLink service and leave most regional stations unmanned. Under the proposed cost-cutting plan devised by State Rail, 1,750 positions will go through voluntary redundancies. Around 30 staff working in administration and corporate areas at CountryLink centres in Newcastle, Broadmeadow and Gosford are likely to be targeted. Today, Premier Carr rejected claims that country rail services would be cut in the overhaul. State Rail Chief David Hill assuring commuters that service and safety standards would not be reduced. The state government is expected to make its decision on the recommendations by the end of the month. As they do most days, nine-year-old Jed Dawson and his five-year-old brother Tom were playing in this park off Rosedale Crescent at Rankin Park this afternoon when Jed noticed the ground had opened up. I saw this hole and I thought it was like just a little hole about this big yeah. and like not very deep. But when I got over there, like there, it was um, really deep. After inspecting the hull and under advice from the Mine Subsidence Board, Newcastle Council workers set about filling the collapsed area, which they believed was more than nine metres deep. According to the Mine Subsidence Board, the cave-in was caused by recent rain which had soaked into an old mine shaft. Yeah, there was about uh, half a metre of water down the bottom, but on top of that there was a, a gap where you could see the water going through into a cavern. I don't know how deep it is, but it's certainly very dangerous. The Rankin Park area is mined in some areas close to 10 metres below the surface, and it's apparently not uncommon for holes to suddenly appear after a soaking. The shaft which caused today's collapse is connected to the Victoria Tunnel Seam, which was mined before 1930. Once the hole is filled, the Mine Subsidence Board will monitor the area for the next month or so, ensuring the playground is once again safe for children. It looks deceptively clear today, but Lake Macquarie had levels of faecal bacteria 100 times the recommended Australian standard. Despite hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent on the region's stormwater system, it's struggling to cope with the heavy rainfall and Lake Macquarie is paying the price. The council's environmental manager says most of the catchment drains are working well, but there's not enough to cope with the volume of runoff. Certainly we need a lot, lot more and, it's, and there's um, a huge task in front of us to, as the uh, urban density increases, we're going to need more and more of these to um, improve the water quality. While they're working on an estuary management plan and new wetland systems, Council says that Hunter Water must also accept responsibility for the drop in water quality. Apart from the stormwater runoff which provides some contaminants, there was also a major failure of the Hunter Water Corps um, system that's resulted in a lot of um, sewage going into the lake as well. Hunter Water admits heavy rains have forced sewage systems to overflow, but denies it's a major cause of the pollution. Hunter Water in recent years has spent about $150 million on that catchment. Um, it's uh, got rid of uh, 20,000 properties that were previously on septic tanks and it's got rid of uh, all the sewage treatment works that were previously discharging to the lake. So I think that's uh, pulling our weight pretty heavily.
The driver of this truck had nowhere to go when the Mitsubishi Magna swerved into its path on a straight stretch of the highway. The truck had been heading south on the Pacific Highway when the collision occurred. About 1.20pm this afternoon, a, a green Magna travelling uh, north along the highway, about 10 k's north of the Tea Gardens turnoff, has veered onto the incorrect side of the roadway very sharply and has uh, collided head on with a, um, a tabletop truck. The truck ploughed over the car, the impact tearing off its front wheels and sending it skidding across the highway. Its shattered load of glass spread more than 50 metres. Meanwhile, the car spun off the road and rolled. Inside, a 28-year-old Warhope woman and her three children. She was killed along with a baby and toddler. Passers-by dragged a three-year-old boy from the wreckage. He was flown to the John Hunter Hospital by the Westpac Rescue helicopter with serious injuries. The truck driver was treated at the scene for shock. Police believe fatigue may be the cause of the crash, a chilling reminder for school holiday travellers to take rest stops during the journey home. I couldn't imagine a worse scenario than this. It's everyone's um, fear, and especially uh, you know, parents' fear, to um, something like this to happen to your entire family. Traffic was banked up for more than four kilometres either side of the crash site. Police set up a detour along the Buckets Way. Sarah Griffiths, NBN News. Five of Thailand's top riders are here for one thing, to master three-day eventing the Australian way. Under the guidance of coach Heath Ryan, they're hoping to fine-tune their skills for international competition. That was OK, but, but that was a bounce. One stride, but it was good, that was good. Three gold medals in the last two Olympics have earned Australia newfound respect on the world equestrian circuit, with many riders turning to the New South Wales Equestrian Centre for elite training. Well, there's huge interest uh, as far as uh, international teams uh, wanting to get involved with Australia, Australian facilities uh, and uh, taking part in Sydney 2000. The Thai team will spend six months undergoing rigorous training. The riders hungry for the experience and skills that have taken their Australian counterparts to the top. And unlike many overseas facilities, there's a hands-on approach which helps to create a bond between horse and rider. We are really um, state-of-the-art operators in terms of producing elite athletes and uh, there is, uh, we're probably the best in the world right now in Australia and there is a very real need, in, especially in the Asian countries, for what we have to offer. A Korean team has already finished a stint at the centre and a group from Saudi Arabia is expected within a few months. The training programs are a significant economic boost for the hunter, with each international team spending around $600,000 in the region. Sarah Griffiths, NBN News. Every night of the year, hundreds of people are forced to brave the elements and sleep outside. For those of us lucky enough to have a home, this way of life is hard to imagine. But some will gain a greater understanding by taking part in the Hunter Mission's 1997 winter sleepout. The sleepout, launched today by the Governor-General, Sir William Dean, is now a local winter tradition. Sir William struck a sombre note when he warned that some sections of society were becoming less tolerant towards the disadvantaged. The sleep out has become very important in raising awareness and funds for the homeless in the region. Homelessness is still very much a part of our society and so it is a great uh, opportunity not only to raise funds but to you know, educate people. 
The Hunter Mission provides a wide range of services to disadvantaged people. Assistance in the form of accommodation, counselling, material and food relief is offered to more than 2,000 people every month of the year. On August the 8th, when the sun goes down over Newcastle, over 500 people are expected to participate in the mission sleep out. Antonia Kidman, MBN News. David Carney and his wife were singing the praises of a $10 investment that saved their lives. I woke up about 4, 4.30, you know, the smoke alarms were going off, um, and I, I guess smell smoke. I had no idea where it was coming from or how it started. Around 4.15 this morning, a wheelie bin was set alight, flames spreading to the side of the house, damaging a wall and timber floor. Heat from the flames also melted the rear of a parked car. Less than 15 minutes later, fire crews were called to St Benedict's Primary School, less than half a kilometre away, to find a building well alight. The former school canteen was extensively damaged. A man living inside the building forced to flee the blaze. We were very lucky. Uh, as I said, this part of the school now isn't used and um, the rest of the school is quite OK. There's been no damage at all. Both fires are being treated as suspicious, however police are not saying whether they're linked. Blake Doyle, NBN News. It's taken seven years, but police finally believe they've solved the murder of 27-year-old Mark Robson, a killing which the residents of Hillcrest Avenue in Nowra will never forget. They discovered pieces of his skull in their front yards. His body has never been found. Police now believe it was burned, then buried by this man, 32-year-old Trevor Thompson, who's now an inmate of Maitland Jail. Maitland Court was told today that a witness contacted police, claiming Trevor Thompson had come to their house in May 1990 saying he'd killed someone with a hammer after a fight in relation to heroin. Thompson not only told someone about the killing, he took that person to a shed where the walls were covered in blood. Among the ashes of a fire, the witness saw the remains of a human foot. Police also claim Thompson burnt the body after rolling it in a piece of carpet. Thompson is already serving time in jail for a separate manslaughter. He'll be back before Maitland Court in September.
Thank <laughs> you.